Hi, everyone. This is John Kasravi. Welcome to episode 80 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. This is a special interview episode that's a little different than the previous interviews I've done. You know, I've been practicing immigration law and just law in general for the last 10 years, and I haven't been doing asylum cases anymore. It's been over five years since I filed or handled an affirmative or defensive asylum case. But in light of all the craziness that's happening at the border and the travel ban and the stop and entry of refugees and asylees in the country, that was an important topic to talk about. I'm, I'm doing a special that's going to be coming up about the history of immigration in the U.S., especially uh, in pre- and post-revolutionary days and the founders and what they thought. And, you know, asylum was, a, was an important part of their history and the U.S. history. So uh, it's a, a very important issue. So I wanted to do this interview with a gentleman that went through a lot and came here, and, and it, it's a really inspiring story. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get it started. Welcome to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. I am the host, Attorney John Kasravi, and I practice U.S. immigration law exclusively. For more information about the program, please visit www.immigrationlawyerspodcast.com. Please note that this recording is informational only and does not constitute legal advice. Please consult with a licensed attorney for specific legal guidance that suits your case. Also, this recording is copyrighted and written permission is required for rebroadcasting. For more information about me, please visit www.jqklaw.com. Today I have Edofe Okporo on the line. Uh, Okporo is a, uh, Edofe is a, is a great guy who's done a lot and achieved a lot in his times. And, uh, you know, I have an immigration practice, so I thought it would be really good to bring a person that's on the other end of it, a person that's applied for benefits, and in this case, uh, a really uh, deserved asylum claim. And we'll get on to all that information with Adolfo today. Adolfo is also the uh, author of a book called Bed 26, Men More of an African Man's Asylum in the United States. Adolfo, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. And you know, in, in New York, it's freezing cold right now in, in, in the East Coast. Oh my God. I'm sure you're feeling the, the, the burden of that. Yeah, is just freezing for the last two days. We were feeling like we're in the Antarctic. <laughs> so, so enough. Uh, I guess let's go to the opposite uh, extreme of it. Uh, tell me about your background. You you grew up in West Africa, is that correct? Yeah, correctly. I grew up in Nigeria. So, I was born and brought up in Wari Delta State, Nigeria, is the Atlantic Ocean shore of West Africa. Yeah. Interesting. And let's talk a little about, about Nigeria, just to have a background. People are not familiar. Nigeria is one of the most populated countries in the world. Uh, technically, it's a very wealthy country. The distribution of that wealth uh, isn't really equal, but uh, it's a very wealthy country. Can you talk about growing up in there between the cultural, religious aspects of it and the, the, the different groups of people there are and how, how you know a diverse society it is? So Nigeria is one of the most diverse society in the world. Nigeria has a population of, of, of 180 million people. Out of the 180 million people, 51% of them are Muslim, 42% is Christian, and the rest is traditional worshippers. Nigeria was colonized by UK, that is the British, and we gained our colonial, uh, uh, we gained our freedom in 1960. So, Nigeria is a country that has over 250 spoken languages and 650 dialects. It's one of the most diverse countries on the face of planet Earth and one of the most populated countries in the world. Interesting. You were born in the 80s? I was born at the dawn of the 90s. Oh, I see. Okay. And so you grew up there. Your family's there. Uh, how big is your family in Nigeria? Oh, I have a very big family. Uh, my immediate family, I have I have one brother and two sisters. Mm -hmm. So I'm the last of four from my mother. And my father also got married to another woman in the year 1992, and she has two kids for my dad. So my immediate family, we are uh, six altogether. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking. And my extended family, we have a big extended family from my mom's side. We have eight kids under my mom's mother. And my mom's father got married to three wives. <laughs> we have like 21 children all oh, wow. in total. So we have a big family of almost 50 people. 
wow, it's a lot of kids, a lot of responsibility. <laughs> so, so you, you grew up in that environment, uh, and uh, you know your asylum claim that you eventually uh, filed in the U.S. Uh, and and the, the reason why you're here is because you're you're a gay man from Nigeria. How was that growing yeah. up? When did you become aware of your sexuality, and when did you know that become you know an issue? It, 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 just you fill us in on on that on that journey. So. Growing up, you don't know what you are, so you are having this spectrum of, I kind of like guys, but I grew up in a society that don't give you any other choice than to like a woman as a man. So I was forced into that belief that being gay is not religiously right, and I was uh, born into a Christian family. So when the first time I ever had an experience with a guy, I was in the, a body school and like I tried to play with a guy and the guy ended up blackmailing me, telling the school that I forced him to do something with me, which wasn't true. So they reported me to my parents and my parents took me to a church and tried to cure me from being gay, like what we call conversion therapy in America. Mm-hmm. It didn't work and in my secondary school, at the end of my secondary school, he took me to an abalist and tried to also cure me from being gay. Did it work? When I graduated from college, my parents also brought a lady for me to get married to. It didn't work. So then my father told me that if I don't get married to her, that I should no longer identify as his child. So I moved to the city of Abuja. It was in Abuja I found some gay men and I began to understand what it means to be a gay man or a member of any community. But I was still a very fervent Christian and I didn't believe according to the Christian religion that being gay is right. So I was fighting myself not until I was 22 before I fully accepted myself. Now, these uh, conversion therapies, how, how intense were they that you went through two or three? Oh my of- God. Oh my God. So like the word for the church, you will be taken to a pastor who is going to make you fast for about 10 days. Fasting is, you are not going to have food to eat so to like pray for you and cure you. The traditional conversion therapy, they take you to an abalist, they cut marks on your stomach and put some concussion there to like, it's just crazy. Oh man. So you went through that, and then how old were you when you decided to, to move cities and start your own? Like, so you were 22? Or? So the first time I ever moved from my family's house, I was 21. I moved to Abuja. When I was 22, I... How far away began... is Abuja from where your family was? Oh, my God. It's uh, a long journey. It's like from California to... According to the U.S. map, it's like traveling from California to New York. So it's... Oh, you just... Went all the opposite direction and started a new yeah, life. Yeah, I went to. I was living in the south. I went to the north. Then how did you like afford to technically just move? And did you have a job by that time, or how did that happen? I got my first job in Abuja. I was a graduate. I studied food science and technology, and I had a master's in nutrition. So I got my first job in Abuja. I was living with a friend. From there, I moved to my own apartment. Interesting. So. Uh, you went to Abuja. You're you're working there, and uh, how is being a gay man? Uh, I mean, obviously, can't be open. Um, but w- how how did you live your life to be able to live free without, or to the extent possible, uh, to to be yourself? So, <laughs> I was working for this clinic. It's like an LGBTQ affirming clinic, mm-hmm. and you can't live freely as a gay man. So, like when you are in Abuja, you can't even. Uh, show any signs of being gay because when you walk in a certain kind of way, you're carrying a bag or something, people ask you, oh, why are you walking like that? Are you gay? Uh, or do you, like, there's so many suspicions that you can't even breathe mm-hmm. or act or live as a gay man except in hiding, attending underground parties with your friends. Now, if someone accused you of being gay or thought you were gay, what are the consequences in that, in that atmosphere? In Nigeria, it's punishable by 14 years imprisonment to be gay. Interesting. And this is based on that, that one particular law that was passed. Is that correct? Yeah. Could you, what year was There's that, 2013? That was There's a law that was passed in Nigeria mm-hmm. that criminalizes sex by 14 years imprisonment. 
Wow. It, it, could you talk about the background on that law? I remember talking to you earlier. It's very interesting how it the issue even came up in the first place. So uh, it was in March of 2013 that the government of Nigeria signed a bill that discriminates like gay men uh, to have access to treatment. But in 2013 December, this the, it was the law was passed to Senate to uh, criminalize same sex. So in January 2014, this law was passed that criminalizes same sex marriage by 14 years imprisonment because people who are married, gay men who are married from foreign country who try to come to Nigeria, the government want to uh, draw the borderline that your marriage is not accepted in the country. Interesting. You know, I think it was uh, maybe a European uh, diplomat that yeah. came with their same-sex spouse, and that's what triggered yeah. this kind of stuff uh, and yeah. changed the laws the, of the uh, 188 million other people. <laughs> wow. the, Sw- the Swedish diplomat that came with his partner was sent back to Sweden. It didn't allow them to stay in Nigeria because their government have to uh, retract because Nigerian government said that they will allow the same-sex couple to act or be able to influence decisions in the country. Interesting. Now, you said before they passed this in March 2013, there was a law that forbid uh, access to health care for gay men? Yes. So, the, like, 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 uh, as a law that discriminates anybody that is gay. So you can't see a doctor? How does that play out? What does that mean exactly? So, so you, you, can't, you can't be gay. The government said that there are no gays in Nigeria. Wow. Interesting. So in this atmosphere, um, you you had been attacked, so you had been outed and people uh, – I mean, you, you also got involved in uh, NGOs uh, to help gay men. Is that correct? Could you follow the timeline of when you got more open about uh, your activism and how that worked out? So in 2014, when this law was passed, a lot of my friends were dying. And we are like, what is happening to my, our friends? So we discovered that most of them were becoming HIV positive and they were afraid to go to clinics because, like, nurses discriminate them for being gay. And they were afraid. They don't know the extent of the law mm-hmm. and how they will be um, subjected under the law. So they were afraid to access healthcare services. They were dying in their houses. So I and some of my friends came together and we formed an NGO called International Center for Advocacy on Right to End, ICA, in Abuja. So the sole purpose of the NGO is to advocate for gay men to have access to treatment. So under the law, it was named MSN, Men Who Have Sex With Men. So you can't call it gay men, but you can call them MSN. Men who have sex with men. So under that provision, they could access healthcare services. So while I was doing that work, it led to me being outed as a gay man. And in 2016, when we returned from the World AIDS Conference in South Africa, I suffered this persecution that people came to my apartment, dragged me out, beat me up. They were shouting that I'm gay, they are found out, and they are going to kill me. They continued beating me up until... I blacked out. When I woke up, I found myself in a clinic where I was working. I applied for a UAE visa and I traveled to the United Arab Emirates. But I couldn't seek asylum there because they did not sign the 1951 Refugee Convention paper. So I came back to Nigeria while I was in hiding. In October 2016, my names and photographs were published as an award winning LGBTQ rights advocate. So I had to flee and I flee to the United States. Wow, that's an incredible story. So you entered the United States. Uh, you, you entered the actual airport. You got into uh, New York, I believe. Uh, but then you went back to the border officers and then re- requested asylum at that time? Yeah. So when I was coming, I know nothing about asylum. I don't know. The word. I've never uh, really looked for the definition of the word asylum. Mm-hmm. So I came and I told I was stamped to stay for six months with a visitor's visa, two years visitor's visa. So I, I don't have any friends or family in this country, so I went to an asylum officer. I don't know if it was an asylum officer. Those people that wear the border patrol shirts in the airport. So I told him that sir, I'm looking for protection because I'm fleeing persecution from my country, Nigeria. I'm a gay man. And my life is in danger. And they took me to a room for questioning. After a series of further questioning, they told me that they're going to take me to a jail. That's a detention center where I'm going to continue my case okay so let's go into detail on that so you enter the airport uh just a note you, you, 
you weren't aware of it, but you could have filed what's called an affirmative asylum case where you'd come in the U.S. and wait to have an interview and done that. But because you went straight to the authorities uh, without you know, filing the paperwork by mail kind of thing, uh, they detained you. So they, they, at, they, at the, did they hold you at the airport initially to ask you questions? Yeah, so they took me to a room for further quest study. And after a series of quest study, they asked me to wait. And uh, another officer came and told me they have to go for uh, a passport. They took my passport. They uh, took my fingerprints and put me on handcuffs and threw me to a bus. They were driving me to the jail. How long did that whole process the... take until uh, from when you they took you to the initial room until you they took you to the jail, uh, the attainment center? How how long did that take? Like eight hours because I was put in a little cell in the airport first. And uh, how were you, you you treated? Okay, to the or were they? How how was the process? Other than I mean, it's a scary situation. You know what's going on, but how how were the officers treating you? They treat me like a piece of garbage. They threw me into a cell in the airport, very cold slab. They asked me to sleep on the slab. It's like a concrete slab. I was like, I was just coming from Nigeria, and it's kind of cold. It's in October, October 28th. Mm-hmm. It's just cold. I don't have uh, protective clothing, but I had to sleep on that slab there. They dragged me out, and they put me on a cough and pushed me into the van, like as if I was a criminal. The van that was going to drive me to the jail. Mm-hmm. And so you, you went to the detainment center, uh, and your book uh, starts bed 26. That's the, the bed number that they gave you in the detainment center. Is that right? Yes. So when I got to the detention center, they stripped off my clothes. Uh, they took me to the room. I gave me a bed, bed 26. But it's funny. Uh, in the detention center, people hardly call you by your name. They mostly call you by your bed number. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's when your asylum uh, case and trial began. So you're at the detention center. How long did it take before you had your initial hearing before the, the immigration judge? Oh, it took like uh, two months. But before then, I was uh, uh, interviewed by an asylum officer for the credible fear interview. Mm-hmm. And after the credible fear interview, they sent me a letter from immigration saying that I have to appear in court. So it took me like two months from the day I came in to the day I appeared in court. So when I appeared in court, the judge asked me, what's my name? Where did I come from? And I told the judge, and the judge asked me to come to next week and submit my asylum form. So before that, I met this pro bono legal counsel in New York City that was going to represent me. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to go by myself first, that whatever the judge said, I should come back and tell them. Mm -hmm. So this pro bono attorneys are helping um, prepare the asylum case with you, which um, you went to your first master calendar hearing alone. uh, And then between the master calendar hearing and having your merits hearing where they discuss the actual uh, details of your asylum claim to make a decision. Uh, how long were you detained after, between that time? So the first time I went to the court, I just said my name and I left. So my lawyers, when I came back, I called them that I've gone to the court. So they sent me the asylum form. The next week, seven days time, I went to the court and I submitted the asylum form. So the judge gave me three months to come back mm-hmm. to for the final year. But a week to that final court, they called my lawyers and told them that they had to extend it seven more weeks because the judge wasn't prepared. So it took me almost roughly uh, four months waiting for the final year. Mm-hmm. And during that time, you're at the detained center. Um, how was life when you're detained? I mean, uh, it, it, it's what do you do for food or fun or how's relationships with people there? How how was it? So one thing is that you can't really develop any good relationship with people there because somebody that is sleeping close to you today tomorrow might be deported. Mm-hmm. And most people there were Spanish speaking, and I speak only English. I don't speak Spanish. It was very difficult. But the most painful part of being in the detention center having to work for a dollar a day having to what to work in the detention center for for a dollar a day voluntary Mm -hmm. work and also like you're in this little room 
that you don't go out for six months. All you see is just a little box on top of your head to know if it's day or night. Wow. And so you were there. Um, eventually, you had your, your hearing. Um, the attorney came with you. How long was the hearing uh, before the judge made a determination? Uh, before I think before my 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 attorney, before they came to call me, my attorney and the judge were inside the room discussing. I think the judge has granted me asylum before I came into the room, mm -hmm. because when I came into the room, uh, the judge said that my case is well documented, uh, that uh, I should go and come back in uh, an hour time. So I came back in an hour time. And the judge has already made this decision because the documentation my attorneys provided, you spoke to my lawyers, they were very, very, uh, very, very thorough in uh, gathering the documents for the asylum case. So, but the judge said that let's, for formality purposes, let's just go through it. So my, uh, my attorneys, they asked me some series of questions and the judge asked their Opposing counsel, if they have, if the state have anything against me, they said no. Altogether, it take thirty five minutes, and I was granted asylum. Now, your case that, is that's not the usual setting. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, go ahead. For my lawyers, the, my lawyers told me that it take usually four hours of questioning. Yeah, you your case is well documented. It was a, it was a, it was. I mean, for asylum cases, go. It was a good case um, because you were so outspoken and you've had, you know. You've gone to international events and all this kind of stuff, and and you weren't shy about your advocacy, and you've you've buried the assaults that are related to it. So it was a good case. It's not a, if someone you know this podcast for immigration lawyers, but if someone listens filing your asylum or a new immigration attorney doing asylum cases, um, the case itself uh, isn't as typical because you're just a you're a unique person in that uh, you you're never afraid to to advocate for your group, and so it became well documented, yeah. and so it came. It, in essence, an easier case to prove that you're not lying. You really are a, a person seeking asylum. So yeah. uh, after the approval, uh, how long were you in de in de being detained for until you were set free? I was released by 10 p.m. that same day. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so they wait the evening so that you don't know where you have been for the last period of time. I think it's a tactics by the private prisons to release you at night where you don't have they don't you give you a phone to call anybody no direction it's really bad they just throw you on the street yes you just open the door and kick you out oh my and uh how did you get your life together at that point you didn't have any friends here not much money uh barely any money um but what what did you do to be able to and this is not too long ago this was uh a, two years ago when, when was your approval date uh, 20 months ago. 20 months ago. So it's, I mean, this is all fresh in your mind, and this is during the current administration that this all happened. Is that correct? Yeah. And so what did you do? How did you pick up the pieces of your life, if you will, and, and restart everything after that? So I wouldn't give credit to myself alone. One thing I would say for myself is that I am a very strong person, so... I know how to pick myself up and motivate myself and say, this is not the end. If I can flee from my country without anything to this place, and I could have died. Mm -hmm. So I shouldn't resort myself to uh, a lower standard. So that was one thing. I was a resilient person. Secondly, there's a host of different angels all along the way. There's a non-profit in the Jay-Z Conference, first of the Jay-Z in New York. They sent a volunteer to pick me up that night that took me to a shelter. I had pro bono legal counsel. Mm -hmm. I had different people coming from different places, calling and telling me that, how can they help me? Somebody helped me to make my resume a U.S. resume star. A lady I used that came for a PhD dissertation in Nigeria. She's living in New York City. She asked me to stay with her for three months rent free. Mm. So it's just like different angels coming from different places. Wow. So I got my first job as a manager of a kitchen called Eat Up Beat in New York City. So it's an all refugee based organization. From there, people saw my work as the manager of Eat Up Beat and they asked me to come and do advocacy for High City East Foundation in New Jersey. While I was working for High City East Foundation in New Jersey, I published my memoir 
and I was invited to become a director of the only refugee shelter in New York City. Now I have a company called the Pods LLC, and I just do a bunch of host of different things for myself and for the community. Mm -hmm. So the more I help people, the better I become more self-sustained. That's wonderful. So you got active. How did you... How'd you write a book? How'd you like, just talk about that? Because everyone wants to write a book, but no one does. <laughs> how did you get yourself to actually write it? Uh, how much time did you spend on it? Was just something you just did every day until it was done? So when I was in the detention center, I was reading a lot of books, and I saw that a lot of leaders in Africa that changed the towns of time, mm -hmm. they were all jailed in prisons. So I had thoughts of time. What would I do? Instead of me to be depressed, I cried every day that I'm here. I started writing. So I wrote the entire book while I was in the detention center. Wow, that's a great use of time. And what, what are the techniques that you have to be able to you know, spend the time to calm down in all this uncertainty? Um, what, what, what did you use? What kind of tools? So the uh, first friends of the JZ and New York sent me a volunteer. So she sent me a book that says, be free wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started doing meditation while I was there. I read a ton of books. So I was keeping my mind busy because the mind is the most powerful tool. When they cripple your mind, your entire body will be crippled. So I knew that that was too that the detention center uses to force people to sign their deportation. So I was always keeping my mind busy. Interesting. And so now you, you're at an advocacy. What was the organization you said that you're, you're a director of now in, in Northeast? I'm the director of RDJ Refugee Shelter. It's the only shelter in New York City that provides housing for asylum seekers and refugees. Interesting. And, and they, do they have a website or something where if someone wants to look into that, how they could find it? Yeah, it's www.r like rice, t like dog, g like john, refugee shelter dot org. Wonderful. And uh, I was just going to ask uh, if someone wanted to contact you or or get to know more about your work, how could they look you up on social media and and direct communication? www.edafeoboro.com Instagram, Edafil Boro, Twitter, Edafil Boro, LinkedIn, Edafil Boro, Snapchat, Edafil Boro, Edafil Boro dot com. Okay, I'll put this all this information in the show notes uh, in the, in, on YouTube in the subject line and on iTunes in the description area so people have it. Uh, thank you so much for for coming and sharing your story. It was, it was I know I read the book and it was it was fascinating. Uh, it just shows like in the world there's a lot of difficulties. You know, people go through a lot of stress, and I'm putting it lightly to say it like that. Uh, but there's ways to overcome it, and when you when you fight it and trying to get help, there's so many people along the way that can help you. I just as you said, the most thing is to be resilient yourself to be able to push through yeah. those difficulties. Yeah, the number one thing. You know, they say that we all have stories, and nobody can tell your story better than you. So do not allow people to steal your narrative from you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Before you leave, is there anything else you want to add? I mean, that was a that was a great quote right there. <laughs> I think maybe we should end it there. But is there anything you want to add? The only one thing I want to add would be uh, one of my favorite quotes. And it goes like this. It says that <laughs> I'd rather live a life I want to live and feel living it than live a life someone else wants me to leave I still feel living it mm -hmm. exactly amen uh, thank you so much uh, for again for sharing your story and speaking with me and reaching out um, I look forward to just being your friend and uh, and just following up on your successes so um, if you ever need anything just let me know thank you John You're welcome. I appreciate it You're welcome. thank God you to bless. the listeners oh, thank you so much have a great day you too